スロットドーンシュwelcome to the latest episode of Editor's Corner, and、uh, I'm Saturn Dave, and I've got、uh, my Saturn brother Nick Panda、uh, with me today. So, really lucky、What's、to、up? have him on. How you doing, man? I'm good. You know, I've been fine. Been busy、uh-huh. with work, been busy with other things, and、uh, but yeah, I, obviously, this document drop from a week ago that just kind of came out of nowhere has、yes. been.、Uh, Pretty significant for anyone who's big into Saturn and Sega research. Oh, absolutely! It's not like the smoking gun that some people have made it out to be. It's not like、no. this big, giant, incredible thing, but it is a, a very accurate and detailed just snapshot in time、sure. of the just extremely critical failure that Sega of America was was in throughout、right. the mid nineties. I mean, when we first got it and we started peeking at pages, and we're like, "Oh, oh, <laughs> you know,、yeah. like what?" Could, you know, so, and I think everybody was overselling it a little bit because we had two hundred pages more to go. <laughs> right, just, right, and this is still pretty significant. It's still a giant amount of information, and、um, some of it is pretty damning. I think.、Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, having you on Editor's Corner is a long time coming, honestly. But what、right. better way to do it? Because you are. A broadcast journalist, and you're also quite a bit of an investigative journalist as well. You do a lot of investigative journalism for <laughs> the the important news, which is about Sega Saturn, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no. In in my professional job, we often go through、um, documents such as these via public records requests. We hardly、right. ever get you know stuff that's confidential for ethical reasons and and whatnot.、Uh, but that does sometimes come out every now and then. What this is is like. I mean, I'm used to going through public court documents for criminal cases,、um, mm-hmm. Freedom of Information Act stuff, for you know whatever money the city is spending on X thing,、um, and other you know publicly run departments like that. We hardly ever get you know a, a a document like this showing us a private business, showing us the inner workings of a private business,、mm-hmm. um, and even in Sega research, we hardly ever get this. So we're you know this is this is a a. You know, it's a, it's literally a confidential document for insiders at Sega, for execs, for leaders, for anyone else in their marketing team, anyone who's responsible for the the pocketbook of Sega of America. Got this nearly three hundred page、yeah. whopper of a document, like someone's personal folders on Outlook, <laughs> right? Yeah, and they had their own notes like scrawled into pages here and there, like some dude at Sega wrote into this scan. <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. And now here we are, twenty some years later, nearly thirty years later, and、uh, we're getting a look at it, which is just fantastic. And I mean, that's something that you do a lot on the Pandemonium reviews. Is you、right. you do a lot of research, and you usually unearth some crazy fact that people haven't didn't know about games before, and it kind of provides a lot of context and insight、mm-hmm. on those games, which makes those things infinitely watchable. So if anybody. Is living under a rock and doesn't know. You need to check out Pandemonium reviews every U.S. Sega Saturn game. It's a phenomenal mini docu series. I can't really call it mini at this point. <laughs> Some of them are mini, yeah. Some of them are more than feature length now. <laughs> I'm a fan of them going long, you know, because you know it takes you long to do them, and then they're much anticipated. So let's get right into this. You did a very, very thorough analysis, like over three-hour reading and analysis that folks should check out too if they want to get into the nitty-gritty. But let's basically talk about like the big picture, the takeaways from this whole document. What can we glean? Right. Yeah. And I, I think one of the first things, one of the first highlights, just in order of the document, is the inventory or the inventory logs that we're、mm. that we're getting a look at.、Um, and this is for every platform that was active at the time. So this document was. From April of 1996, though there are some sections that come from March of 96, January 96, and as a whole, this entire collection of documents is giving us a look at the inside of Sega of America between May 1995 and April 1996. And for those who don't know, this was a fiscal year review for 97 that was bought on eBay for about $450 a year ago, and then through, there was an effort to archive it. They kind of fell through, so the gentleman, the Golden Dreamcast, who bought it,、uh, just went ahead and did it himself and put it up on the Internet Archive, and it made it to Sega Retro. So just to fill folks in, this is a huge binder 
uh, what did you say? 280 plus pages, 289. And that's okay. if you're counting scans of folders and stuff like that. Oh, right. But okay. The PDF is 289 pages. And yeah, big shout out to Golden Dreamcast for posting this publicly for everyone to see. I mean, you could easily sell this to someone like a private collector who will shelve it forever and never show it to anybody. Um, so it's, it's, we're, we're very fortunate as a community to have someone like Golden Dreamcast Absolutely. buying this for everybody to look at. Uh, it's very valuable to, um, studying video game history. Absolutely crucial. Starting with inventory, uh, what do you got? So, you know, they go over as of April 3rd, 1996 across Game Gear, Genesis, Sega CD, 32X, Saturn. How many chunks of hardware do they have in their warehouse? How many copies of specific games do they have in their warehouse? They even go over peripherals like you want to buy an AC adapter for the Game Gear. How many of those do they got in the warehouse? And they break it down in these columns. If, if you go to page 40 of the PDF, that will tell you it's like a key, sort of a legend of what right. each column means. They're weird, jargony words, but they're explained in the document for the mm-hmm. layman to understand. Um, for nearly everything that they were working on across all platforms, we would find out that there were tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of copies of a certain thing rotting in their warehouse with very few stores ordering them, very few retailers ordering them. Some were doing okay, but most of them were in a situation where it's like, okay, there are way more of this thing in the warehouse than there are people ordering. And let's, you know, a couple of quick examples. Um, Sonic and Knuckles for the Sega Genesis. At this point in time, they had 250,000 copies in their warehouse. Zero stores were ordering them. And this is, of course, when 16-bit's on its way out. We see a lot of Genesis stock despite overall 16-bit sales going down over the previous few years. Right. And they have so much inventory of 16-bit goods that are not getting ordered. Game Gear stuff, they add up the amount of Game Gear games that they have in the warehouse. And it's 941,000 Game Gear games. That's nearly a million and only 7,000 of those games are being ordered by retailers at that point in time. That is dismal. 32X, horrible picture painted here. Going over the various hardware bundles they had, you want to buy the console, you want to buy it by itself, you want to buy it with a specific game, they have these individually listed. You add them all up, they had just over 400,000 32X consoles on hand in their warehouse zero stores ordering them literally no store at all is ordering those machines and later on in the document they talk about that they they talk about this inventory issue Mm -hmm. and for 32x one of their like goals is to determine the scrap value of the 32x consoles that they had they were going to drop the price down to 50 some at some point 30 dollars like a test market right yeah yeah and even with that incredible discount they were still thinking we're going to have to scrap some of these. And it's believed that some of them might have been used to make printers. <laughs> yeah. And then some of them were just straight returned. Right. I read an article just the other day, a kid who worked uh, Babbage's uh, through all three console releases mm-hmm. uh, you know, from 94 to 96. And, you know, it said that the 32X was pretty much dead on arrival. It just sat on the shelf. Nobody bought it. And they ended up right. having to send it back. It uh, died at sat- launch. Yeah. yeah. And the Saturns themselves... Uh, sold all of the pre-orders at the early launch, but then the rest sat in the back of the store. But like when Sony PlayStation came out, it was just boom, hotcakes, like moving them out. And they couldn't even, they had more people wanting them than they had Sony PlayStation. Right. They couldn't make enough of them. (laughs) They couldn't keep up with demand. And this does, this document does log, you know, the amount of Saturn kits that they have that are being ordered. Mm. And it's, you know, the Saturn hardware on hand isn't as, as bleak of a picture. They have 25,000 in the warehouse and about a thousand or so ordering them. So clearly they're still manufacturing consoles. But you get into some of the games and some of the peripherals. That's when you get into the to the shit of the Saturn inventory. Mm. Um, they add up all the inventory that they have on things like controllers, multi taps, uh, RF units, Virtua sticks, the arcade racing wheel. All those peripherals added up was about two hundred fifty thousand, and only five hundred of those were being ordered. And then games were doing okay. It was one hundred and eighty seven thousand Saturn games in their warehouse and 70,000 of them were being ordered within the next couple of weeks. So those were still getting somewhat filtered out of the warehouse at a decent pace. It really depended on the game. They had a lot of copies of specific games that weren't doing well at all. Um, Like uh, 
uh, Gen War and Black Fire. They, you know, printed a ton of copies of those and um, th- uh, didn't, didn't sell a whole lot of those. So they have sales data in this document as well for Saturn games. Right. And I'll just kind of jump ahead to that section uh, if I can find it here. Well, while you're finding it, uh, I w- w- watched your analysis video and I was thinking, could it be that they, you know, in 92 and 93, when they had really big years and right. they probably needed a lot, they were selling a lot of Sonic 2. They were just like, okay, well, let's order 250,000 more, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's get then, a quarter million Sonic and Knuckles cartridges. And right. they didn't anticipate just like the brakes getting hit, you know, from all of the kind of bad will that was being generated with Sega, you know, with all the, the multiple mm-hmm. consoles and the mixed messages and so then all of a sudden there wasn't the demand for it anymore or or just right. you know virtual fighter hit everybody saw that and nobody cared about 16 bit anymore but either way they overordered which is something that a lot of companies don't do now like nintendo starting all the way back with the wii just artificial scarcity you know let's just make less and pretend that it's like super rare and have everybody mm-hmm. clamoring for it rather than having more and then having a warehouse full of it you know Exactly. Yeah. Sega was kind of doing the opposite of that, apparently. <laughs> I think companies have learned, you know, um, of course, gamers hate it now, you know, when it's incredibly difficult to get a PS5. But I mean, you know, of course, it's safer, you know. Anyway, about those uh, numbers, you, you were looking up uh, specifics on Saturn inventory. Right. Yeah. So Saturn sales, they they have a a section of this document where they've added up the amount of copies of Saturn games that sold between May, the launch in May and uh, the end of December of 1995. So it's first year, essentially. It's first calendar year. Mm. And um, some of these sales numbers, like we knew that um, that the Saturn didn't do well in its first year, but we didn't know it was this bad. The top selling game was Daytona USA at 89,000 copies sold, which that's not like awful. That's not an awful figure. That's that's OK. Right. But there were other games for the PlayStation that were selling hundreds of thousands of copies that year. And meanwhile, Saturn's top selling game is only selling only sold 89,000 copies. Wow. And we get into things like Sega Rally, which they note as a slacking uh, s- sports title. There's a s- separate document about the sports game status. And they noted that Sega Rally wasn't selling as well as they wanted it to. That wasn't at 42,000 copies which that's not horrible, but it's not what they had hoped. And a couple of things here. Rally racing in general was not as popular in America as, say, Europe and Asia. But, I mean, this was still a pretty good racing game at the time. It was one of the best-looking home console racers ever to that point. And um, they actually had Sega of Japan give them an, an unfinished version of Rally to release in North America mm-hmm on November 18th, 95, so they could sell Rally during the holiday shopping season. And that didn't seem to work. I mean... That just goes, shows their desperation, though. Like, exactly. the amount of desperation. They were completely beholden to SOJ for a lot of things. For hardware, they had to ask mm-hmm. ask for it. They had to beg for boxes, you know, bo- uh, if they were going to put out a console. They pretty much did software in-house, and they had autonomy for that with the long boxes and stuff. You know, but I mean, when it came to hardware or anything else, it was like write a letter to SOJ begging right. for them to send us something. They had to beg for dev kits. I can only imagine some of these requests would come across SOJ's desk and they're just like, what? What do they want? They want us to alter nights so that it can be for their market. <laughs> you know, they're like, screw you guys. We're not- right. Yeah. That was another thing. <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah. By the way, uh, we just, uh, I hope you're okay with this, but we're just going to promise that we're going to use Yuji Naka's engine on, on such and such. And <laughs> they're like, uh, care to, care to ask, you know, like, right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe let us know months ahead of time instead of this last minute request. It probably had something to do with the friction or the drama between those two. Oh, I'm sure. Because again, you know, Japan, there's a proper way to do things and there's an improper way to do things. And the American, you know, gunslinger kind of, you know, just shooting from the hip, like we're just going to do whatever, you know, doesn't really fly, you know, or at least maybe they'll accommodate for a while, but after a while they'll feel like it's a little impolite, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that was another thing mentioned. You brought up nights. There's like a part of the document where they're talking about um, games that are soon to be out and their problems with them. And Sega of America said that Nights into Dreams was too childlike. Mm. They wanted to market to teens and younger adults. And they were worried that Nights was marketed towards like babies, basically. And they wanted to they asked they wanted to ask Sega of Japan and presumably they must have 
ask them to make Nights into Dreams uh, more mature for the American audience, you know, like making Kirby's face angry in ads sort of thing. Like they wanted to alter the artwork of Nights to make it more profitable. Right, which would be something if it was like a third party game. But this is Yuji Naka we're talking. You know, this is like, yeah, <laughs> they're fiercely, fiercely protective over this their is stuff. royalty over there. I mean, right. <laughs> we get, there's a March 27th email from Shinobu Toyota that says now that this is Sony's fall release of uh, Crash Bandigoo. Bandicoot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bandicoot. Sick. <laughs> Let's find out their marketing plans, TV creation direction, media budget promotion, and reflect back on our Knights plans. And I think that Tom realized that it's like, okay, Knights is the closest thing that we have to a mascot game that could right. go up against Crash Bandicoot. Let's just, okay, let's make it more prominent at E3 because they had it kind of squirreled away off to the side. Mm -hmm. and, and they're like, at the same time, our would-be mascot game, Sonic Extreme, is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Right. It's not even close to done. Let's start dismantling that and sweeping it under the carpet. So they made what was on this uh, on this floor plan, this huge uh, dominating, you know, it was like the first thing you see when you come in the room and it spanned almost the entire width of their area. With right. What they thought would be, you know, playable demos. They ended up kind of cutting it in half and putting it off to the side and sharing that space with knights. It's yeah. just funny. It's 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 pretty hilarious. Going back to some of the sales numbers, I'll only highlight a couple more here. On the very low end of Saturn games in 1995, Genwar only sold 4,000 copies. That was the lowest. That's so sad. That was the lowest. And yeah. uh, as a stall, a legitimately good game, only mm -hmm. 9,000. Blackfire sold 12,000. Yeah. Um, and they noted that Mysteria Realms of Lore sold zero because they had to recall it due to a, a copyright dispute with Dungeons and Dragons. They later re-released it as Blazing Heroes. So that, that RPG, Riglord Saga, is essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. They had to basically not sell it in 95. They missed out on RPG sales that year. So I wanted you to comment about that. So I have a copy of Mystaria, Realms of Lore, right? Yeah. And there are collectors say that it's about one to one. They're, they're about equal in terms of like being able to find them out there. They printed a lot. So by saying zero, do you think that's to protect their asses? Like, do you think yes. that, that, okay. So they, they're yeah. just pretending like they didn't sell any of those because they don't want it on paper. They don't want it on paper that they actually, uh, because of the litigation potential. If you litigation. go on Usenet, there are people throughout 1995, plenty of Saturn owners saying, yep, I bought a copy of Mysteria or, oh, I can't buy Mysteria right. anymore. And there's a thread of people talking like, oh, those who got it are lucky to have bought it early because now you can't get it anymore. They had to recall it. And for the record, they're just saying we didn't sell. They're any saying of it. zero. Yeah, <laughs> okay. they're saying we didn't sell any of it, which, you know, that's not good metrics to say that the, you know, the only RPG in your console sold nothing when, you know, right. this would later prove to be a competitive market for RPG games. And Sega had, you know, a, a bit of a foothold on that in 16 bit with Fantasy Star, Lunar, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Okay. Not good. Not good. Well, um, anything else on that front on the Saturn software? If we're talking software, let's talk sports. Yeah, so there's another doc. Uh, they talk about the sports um, sales quite a bit, which is important. Like I know a lot of us, most of our listener base is not, we're not really big into sports games. A few of us may be, but most of us want shmups and fighters and like the mm -hmm. actions and RPGs and stuff like that. We don't play a lot of sports games, but that was the bread and butter for Sega of America. That was like what put food on the table for the Sega Genesis. Uh, more than a million uh copy sold of i can't remember which nfl game it was on genesis I, maybe it was joe montana either mm -hmm. way they sold a crap ton of football games and that made them a ton of money and in 1995 they couldn't get a football game released quarterback attack with mike ditka does not count although we love it very much it's that's not really a, a true football <laughs> yeah. game um <laughs> so they talk about um that being a critical issue and on one page they compare the sales of world series baseball to nfl game day on playstation World Series Baseball for Saturn came out in late September of 1995. Not to be confused with World Series Baseball. Exactly. And that only sold 59,000 copies in 1995. Not awful. But then you look at NFL Game Day on PlayStation, which released after World Series Baseball, months later in November. And in very short order, nearly quadrupling the sales of World Series Baseball, pushing a couple hundred thousand copies. Mm -hmm. And that's already beating every game on Saturn in North America more than double the sales of every game on Saturn in North America individually in that year. I think that reflects the larger install base though. You know, I mean, across oh, yeah. the board, you're going to see it over and over and over again. This PlayStation title sold more than Saturn, but I mean, 
look at how many uh, consoles they sold in the first month. What was it? A hundred, almost 140,000. Yep. And then that's on page 48 of this document. Uh, month by month, we see uh, throughout 1995, the sales of Saturn consoles and the sales of PlayStation consoles. And, you know, we had that surprise release in May to, quote, get the jump on Sony. Not a mm-hmm. real quote, but that was like the cited reason for mm-hmm. Japan forcing the early launch in America. Uh, something Tom Kalinske has said nowadays he did not want to do because they didn't have right. enough games. Yeah. Somehow they thought it would be an advantage. It definitely backfired. The The console wasn't ready to release that early in America. No. And by virtue of there just not being enough consoles manufactured. Yeah. Um, they didn't have enough machines to sell to all the stores in America in May. They had to roll out gradually by region. And this is um, this is something that's in a now 404, unfortunately, but I've screenshot it, mm-hmm. uh, Business Wire article showing that, um, yeah, it launched in May, but, you know, states like Ohio, Michigan, and the city of Nashville didn't get it until July. Milwaukee didn't get it till late July. Philadelphia couldn't get it till like the butt end of July, you know, it, it, and you can, you can map it out and see that every major region of the United States didn't get the Sega Saturn until about August 19th. Mm. And this is reflective in that sales page on for on page 48 here of console sold by month in may the first month of the saturn priced at four hundred dollars it sold just under twenty thousand consoles mm-hmm. and then each month that number went down they only sold ten thousand in july they only sold ten thousand in august september rolls around the playstation comes out saturn picks up again almost twenty thousand sold in september but mm-hmm. then the playstation sing just in that one month so it sells 130,000 consoles in september already more than the total amount of Saturn sold. Gut punch. Yeah, it's horrible. And then we get into the later end of the year. We see Saturn drop its price twice to 350 in October to 300 bucks in November. Sony isn't dropping their price at all. Now they're matched. And then we get to the end of 1995. Saturn picks things up significantly in December. But the grand total sales of 1995, PlayStation sells 645,000. And the Saturn's at less than half that at just 237,000. Mm. Um, just absolutely annihilated by by Sony in that one year alone. We knew it was bad. We did not know it was that bad. Like, this is horrible. I mean, meanwhile, they're wasting their time and their money with this 32X thing that's Mm -hmm. just going to sit in warehouses, right? Right. They got 400,000 of them rotting. And rob them of IPs that could potentially be Saturn IPs, launch IPs. If It's just crazy if they had stuck with that. I mean, I know we always say shoulda, coulda, woulda, but if they had stuck with the September 2nd and really don't even do the 32X and right. develop those titles for Saturn, you're working on SH2s, right? So if like, think if Star Wars Arcade was a launch title. Think if like the absolutely. proper Doom port was a launch title. Like the, That would have been so much better. You'd have had this huge launch blitz with tons of software mm-hmm. and you focus advertising on game footage not all of the stupid stuff that doesn't matter and you know of course their 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 marketing campaign was just a complete blunder and wild and out yeah I mean, we all love it right like it's great for memes you know and it's great to put shots of creamy 3d graphics in your videos <laughs> and stuff but i mean at the end of the day i think they just misjudged their consumer you know they kind of yes, again it was really. an inability to change it was an inability to read the room and evaluate like how can we change in response to the way that the market has changed you know Robert Leyland, the one of the leads on Gen War, one of the you know, the first person I've ever interviewed for this series, said it best when he told me that Sega had a lot of success with the Genesis in America. Then Sega of America got arrogant. They got cocky. They got mm-hmm. a little too big for their britches. They thought, all right, we're doing great. Um, and they kind of lost track of what made them successful. They lost track of treating third parties well, treating the media well. Absolutely. Things Mm -hmm. started falling apart. I also feel like because they were competing so fiercely head to head with Nintendo, they got into this mindset that they had to compete with Nintendo on every single front. So if Nintendo releases a handheld, we have to release a handheld. Mm -hmm. They don't realize is there's another company coming and it has tons of cash and it's just going to focus all of it, put all of its eggs in this one basket called the PlayStation. And, And so it's like, Sega was too busy thinking like they had to do every single thing that Nintendo did. But what they really needed to do was put out a 32 bit console that was successful, you know, exactly. And, and, and they were just too busy plugging up the dam, you know, several holes, like with the 32 X and the Sega CD and the nomad and the game gear. That's, that's definitely what happened. Did you see that, that email about the nomad where Len Ciceretto 
kind of chews Tom out. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, you're going to hear this a lot this year. So you need to realize when we cut every corner, there isn't much left. <laughs> and Tom is like, you know, why didn't we, you know, advertise the nomad? It's like, with what? With what money? You know? Exactly. Uh, the, the back and forth emails uh, between Tom and some of the other execs at Sega were pretty good. That's good. At the very, very end of the, the, the large PDF for those wondering and wanting to read them. Yeah, so much definitely. good content there, though. It's great. Not a whole lot of like vicious back and forth per se. No, but... it's more like passive aggressive stuff. Yeah, you know, it's it's just kind of like, it. <laughs> yeah, because you know, because well, to be fair, Tom starts off the email saying, "Was anything done?" You know, that's kind of like saying, "Did anybody drop the ball?" You know, is it too late? Right. Is something we could have done. <laughs> and the folks that are like basically where the buck stops they're like well uh what did you expect us to do i mean you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so it's it was frustrating you could tell he was frustrated in those emails he he went to japan he saw that it was just killing it over in japan because of course in 96 they had sagata you know they had this wonderful campaign they so the saturn had a personality it, it had did. kind of like a persona you know its personality wasn't the weird conehead commercials that we were trying over here right exactly yeah. you know they so yeah they, they he was seeing that and he was just kind of frustrated because it was the complete opposite of what was happening in the west and he was like how do we show that at e3 mm -hmm. how, how do we show that it's doing well in japan and he's like how do we mirror the saturn success in japan over here so you could tell that tom knew what was going on you know, we're all always like, why didn't Sega of America see this? Why didn't they understand that what they were doing was wrong? Well, we get a lot of self-awareness in this document through the emails and other statements in the mm -hmm. marketing plans and business plans that no, they were very aware that they were not doing well. They were very aware of specific problems they had mm -hmm. with certain games, genres, with their horrible communication between America and Japan. They were very, very well aware of that. They were. And Tom was frustrated. You can read it in his emails that he was just uh, annoyed. And he did resign months after the events of this document. That's right. It's July, right? Yeah. He, he turned in his resignation, I'm pretty sure, July. And I think he stayed on until September. He agreed to stay mm -hmm. on for a bit. But yeah, he turned in his resignation that summer. Yeah. In the list of, uh, I don't know, there's like this. These are the things we got to do. Strategies. We have to price competitive to PlayStation at 249 of course, yeah. little, little did they know in one month, PlayStation was going to drop a bomb on them. PlayStation dropped to one ninety nine to compete with Nintendo sixty four, which was eminent. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so it was like PlayStation drops to one ninety nine, and then Sega of America is in like talks with SOJ overnight the first night of E three, and they're going back and forth and back and forth, and they finally get approval to drop to one ninety nine, and then they have to go to Sega of Europe and do the same thing with those guys, you know. And it was like one hundred ninety nine pounds. So I, we, they were already bleeding, right? Now now mm -hmm. they're just gushing, you know? Um, make Virtual Fighter 2 a huge hit. I like how they just say, make it a hit, you know? How do we... Right. <laughs> you know? Just make it a hit. Just just figure it out. <laughs> make all these key titles a hit, Knights, Virtual On, you know? Position Saturn as a high-tech console with an internet browser peripheral introduced at E3. So that was one of the big things in this document. A lot, lots of talk about the net link. Right. Lots of talk about positioning Saturn as a high-tech console. So they're like, okay... This is our Hail, Hail Mary pass. We're going to rebrand this as an internet appliance uh, for, for 400 bucks and, and hope that that sells Saturns, you know? You can browse the internet and play, you know, Virtua Fighter against your cousin on the East Coast or something like that, which, of course, mm -hmm. Virtua Fighter was not a Netlink game, but, you know, no. <laughs> probably thought it could have been. Or they didn't have any games yet at, at E3. What they did right. have is a browser. You know, they had the Planet Web browser running yeah, on the dial up jpegs Correct. loading you know one one image per two minutes you know <laughs> the yeah, kind of yeah. a web browser so i guess the um the pluto prototype existed they, you know they had soj build that first and that's right. kind of the the backbone technology that the netlink carts were based on but it being a prototype and not passing ul inspection and fcc guidelines mm -hmm. they couldn't plug it into a live phone line at e3 so they couldn't show it at e3 basically and uh, what they did show is like a cobbled together, half American, half Japanese setup, you know, sh <laughs> showing folks that they could browse web pages. Yeah. Everything about it was very like thrown together last minute, you know. Um, it gives me anxiety, honestly. Exactly, <laughs> Just, exactly. And I, I, I like that they, they talked about selling the Pluto, which for those unaware, that was the unreleased prototype of a Saturn that includes a, it has a Netlink modem built in and it has a hard drive built into it. Um, 
they were going to sell it for was it 550 bucks or something like that right when later that year the price of a netlink adapter msrp is 200 and mm-hmm. the price of a saturn would drop to 200 so you could either buy a netlink and a saturn for 400 bucks or get this all in one for 550 for- pay an extra 150 bucks right <laughs> well what they ended the up so they, then they ended up packing a saturn and the netlink into one with the keyboard yep. for for what uh Four hundred dollars, basically, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think it was three ninety nine, and I mean, okay, that was kind of like a compromise, you know. But it's like at that point, the Saturn itself had such poor cachet, you know, like and no. It, it had such a mind. weak start and such a low install base out right out of the gate. Like they're they're trying to recover. Did you notice there were there were some memos about them starting to build kiosks at this time? They're like, okay, we we need to gain parity with uh, Sony on the active kiosk front. So they like yes, manu- yeah, manufactured like four thousand kiosks, and I mm-hmm. noticed Circuit City was like one of their few like supporters. They had like <laughs> <laughs> they had a bunch at Circuit City. There were a lot of stores that had PlayStation kiosks that didn't have. Saturn kiosks, including KB Toys, which Tom Kalinske has cited in an interview that that's one of the business relationships that was ruined by the surprise launch. Mm -hmm. They had Mm -hmm. no presence at KB. And meanwhile, Sony had like nearly 800 kiosks throughout KB. Mm -hmm. Um, There were other stores with that similar situation where there were either no Saturn kiosks or way fewer than there were PlayStation. But Circuit City uh, was a Sega, a Sega man. Apparently they had 350 kiosks and only a hundred PlayStation, so hey, it's there crazy. You go. Yeah, I know that's crazy. And Toys R Us was even. Um, they uh, at least at this point in time, they had the same amount of Saturns as Playstations. Yeah, Sega did have a pretty good relationship with Toys R Us. Like always did. Yeah, the Pico especially sold well at Toys R Us, which is noted in the document. That's true. Pico did okay for a while, right? You know, mm-hmm. until the end there. But you can yeah. tell at this document that the Pico was kind of on its way out the game gear was on its way out and they unfortunately manufactured a shit ton of game gears that and it was they couldn't sell anymore at this point and the sega cd was like yesterday's news that was done they were over it so so you said that so there was some ad budget for game gear i think but it was was. just print right yep that's right no advertising for nomad and yet it's funny they had this huge nomad booth at e3 (laughs) that they spent 30 grand on (laughs) exactly it's just like you're not advertising it they um in the kind of later end of this document or what Dave was just talking about is, yeah, they show their marketing budget for each platform and sometimes marketing budgets for specific games. And, you know, they had plenty of marketing budgeted towards the Saturn. They wanted to, you know, put advertising out for it. And, yeah, some of the other consoles, they just had practically no money at all directed towards advertising them, even though they allegedly had so many copies and so many chunks of hardware left in storage that were just rotting so, personal question yeah i know you think that they shouldn't have made a 32x right do you think they should have made a nomad no no absolutely not that was a waste no one no one bought it uh it's a fun niche collector's item right it's, it's fun that they made it at all i think it's cool that it exists right but i don't think they should have made it yeah i think a lot of people would agree with you I think they didn't really know that they shouldn't have made it. Maybe there were some at Sega who saw the downward trend in 16-bit and thought, this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Um, I do like the gumption and the audacity of, let's do this because we can. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) I mean, and and arguably, Nintendo kind of did that too. They're like, let's make a fake 3D goggles right they made the virtual it was a huge bomb but then Mm -hmm. they had a bunch of cash reserves they could kind of absorb that you know whereas while sega Sega made several bombs (laughs) yes exactly (laughs) and wasted so much money on other i think the cdx was pretty cool as a kid at least it was very expensive but i thought it was a really cool idea you know it was a genesis it was a sega cd it was a cd player there was a lot of value for the money yeah and i think if anything, that you know, if they did make the, C- the Sega CD, of course, you said that Sega CD was pretty much done by this document, right? Oh, right. Like, um, by the time this document came out through the inventory stuff and the marketing data that they included. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Sega CD was like, even even Sega seemed to be over it, so to speak. Like, they were like, yeah, we better, we better stop making these. But I think it's clear that the Sega CD needed to happen for them to get their uh, C legs in terms of like learning how the backup RAM works. Oh, uh, absolutely. Learning, learning how CD, sys, you know, CD streaming works and stuff like that. So it definitely helped inform the Saturn, you know, as a CD console. Right. 
and people got to remember the Sega CD was successful. Yes, it, it was. It, it was. Well. It has a good library. It sold a lot. Like in the early nineties, it was, it was a good idea. Right. Right. So if they had just done like that and then kind of put it into the CDX and really pushed that and then really just focused on building up this next platform and making it a, a really good one. They'd have been in such a better position, you know? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Completely agreed. What else? Um, let's see. Regain sports leadership. Yeah. Oh, regain advertising, PR, communication. Uh, we need to communicate coolness <laughs> lead <laughs> versus Sony. Advertise aggressively versus PlayStation. And of course they did. Like almost immediately they started putting out those ads that were like, fly PlayStation. You are not ready, you know, or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where they were just like dropping it off buildings and stuff. Yeah. The the skeet shooting in 64, it wasn't worth waiting for, you know, that kind of stuff. They They were focusing their attention more on that stuff than the like eight processors with eight pro you know like exactly that's kind of the direction they went in and of course uh we weren't buying it no no they no definitely not another one is sell through current genesis game gear cd software inventory that's like an action item how do you just sell through all that stuff <laughs> right know? yeah and they had so many left over it was so not like marketable anymore no one was no retailers were buying it so that was such a strange goal to have in mind like it was clearly impossible yeah it's an impossible goal. I mean, you just end up having to put it in a landfill or something, or maybe right. they're just talking about find ways of um, discounting it to like five bucks a game so that people basically take it. You know, I don't you gotta know. wonder. And I did hear from a lot of people just talking since this document came out that they remember getting like Genesis games like that for literally 10 bucks in store. Yeah. Um, at around this point in the nineties. So it's they true. were trying to severely discount them. And I don't know if it, was enough to get rid of the hundreds of thousands, you know, the millions of games that they just had rotting in the warehouse. But this was a, this was a, one of their go-to strategies because they did the same thing with the Saturn when it went out yep, exactly. uh, late, 90, late 97, early 98, you could find Saturn games in bargain bins and it was so sad, but th this is just kind of one of their go-to strategies is like, just knock everything down to five or 10 bucks and get it out. Right. Yeah. Get expenses and organization in line with likely sales. Complete any restructuring by April 15th. And of course, I think that was like the beginning of the end with, for Tom. Like he, he was just like, well, we'll restructure, but I'm not going to be. It, it made sense for him to leave anyway, because he did. His whole job was, you know, hired gun, uh, make the Genesis a success, which he did. Right. It was the exact same formula that he did with Mattel, you know, and uh it, it's just like by this time, he didn't really have control. You know, I mean, he was forced to launch early anyway. So it was like at that point, things were out of his control anyway. And he didn't really have a reason to be there. And he could, you could kind of hear his mind <laughs> a little bit in some of those emails. Right. His frustration, I yeah. think. And of course, we have to ask the guy this to know for sure. But I, I do, think yeah. he could tell that like the writing was on the wall for Sega of America. There, you know, mm -hmm. the the finances were were not there they were not where they were supposed to be uh and it wasn't to to him it mu it must not have looked like a um what's the word i'm looking for very manageable situation i guess it wasn't uh it was a sinking ship it wasn't a pit that they could dig themselves out of right yeah there's a a fun document here going over the status of some of their sports games it's page 220 okay and that goes over um some of the sports games that are in the pipeline and their problems with them and um, they, again, going back to the football problem, the they couldn't get an American football game out, and they really needed one. They needed to recapture the football fan base they had on Genesis that they were losing to Sony, and they had this micro pros NFL game that they were working on. And uh, under issues, it lists extremely low quality. <laughs> yes, <laughs> extremely low That's quality. Problem, and six months late, not finished, and then they have a, a separate column next to it called action required so okay what do we do about this problem mm -hmm. so extremely low quality is the issue their solution kill title right <laughs> or sell to third party and they had another similar issue with nba action where issue game quality um <laughs> just like they're recognizing that some of these games are really bad right and nba action in particular was being developed by gray matter the people who did nhl all-star hockey mm -hmm. which was a horrible game that mm -hmm. was a horrible hockey game um and uh they wanted to like send developers to help gray matter they wanted to like send people from sega into gray matter to like unfuck their game essentially 
and it was using the same engine as NHL All Star Hockey, according to the document, which that time right. was a big problem. Yeah, I mean they ended up uh, what outsourced? They ended up grabbing Radical and slapping their name on Radical's title power play. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So and NHL ninety eight is definitely it's Radical Entertainment's power play engine, and you can actually see it on the banners on the side of the rink. It says they 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 put their little they scrolled their little logo into there. Uh, on the back screenshot, it's, it says basically they just bought their game and slapped their name on it because they wanted to look strong. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was nuts. What anything else on the sports front or on that? Uh, I mean, there's there's plenty more to talk about on the sports front, but those are kind of the highlights in my mind. Um, just that they they clearly weren't selling him well, and um, the games that were in the pipeline for '96, they had a lot of problems with. Mm-hmm. Um, the important ones being football and basketball they couldn't seem to get right world series baseball was okay as far as like game quality but they the problem with that that they've noted a few times that they couldn't get world series baseball to come out during peak baseball season so like trying to get a baseball game out while you know uh timing baseball is being played while mlb is in season in the u.s exactly to get out in time for the all-star game which is for those who are unaware for those outside the u.s and canada the all-star game is kind of like the cherry on top of our baseball season that's when they get all the good players from all the teams into two separate teams that play against each other at the end of the season correct me if i'm wrong dave you're more of the baseball guy middle of the season middle of the season that's right early summer and um they couldn't seem to get world series baseball out in time for that uh, for that very well watched sports game that they could put a bunch of ads in and be like, mm-hmm. Hey, buy this baseball game. Same with, you know, football and other sports seasons. They couldn't seem to get these games out when they were in season on television in North America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they also had a, uh, they also had some notes saying w- w- in terms of the 16 bit games, we want to make them all look like 32 bit games. <laughs> yeah. Know? They mentioned so, like, that, which is like, they're really uh, grasping at straw. They're like, what can we do? They're, they're, they're scratching their heads and saying like, we need to focus on a titles, you know, quality mm-hmm. titles. We can't have any of this poor quality software. We, we need to make all the 16 bit stuff look like vector man or whatever, you know? Right. Right. And vector man looked pretty good, but I mean, it it for, for a Genesis game, it looks fantastic, but it's not a 32 bit game. No, but it's like, as it's much, it's as much blood as you can squeeze from that turnip. Right. So here's a thought experiment for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. You're Bernard Stoller. And I, you, you're on a plane flying over to Sega of America because you got yeah. this job and you're reading through this document that this is your new job. How are you going to save this? How are you going to, uh, you know, make this ship float? And so I have to ask, it's like, you're reading all this stuff about poor right. quality software, right? Do how do you react? You know, I mean, people jump on Bernie for killing Saturn. If this is the only exposure Bernie has to the Saturn, seeing all these critical failures, all these poor sales numbers, it launching poorly, the games are not selling, the games they're making are not doing well, they can't get Japan to give them other games that they want, or at least not on their terms. Bernie's not a gamer. Bernie Stoller wasn't a video game enjoyer. He was mm-hmm. a businessman. Mm-hmm. So if a businessman is looking at this and thinking, okay, we got to fix Sega of America. He's not going to, he's not going to think the Saturn is the answer. <laughs> I, I think when he says the Saturn is not our future, I don't think that's, I think that's him saying like, we're not making money off of this. We need yeah. to do something else. I'm honestly surprised he took the job. <laughs> like I'm kind of surprised he did too. I mean, he got fired from Sony, right? He kind of needed something, but this is true. Yeah, you this can is get true. so to speak and say, right. was a, that was a horrible Bernie Stoller was dealt an extremely bad deck of cards. Yes. Um, I don't agree with everything you did, obviously. No, and I yeah. think a few people do. Um, but you, you kind of have to understand why he pulled the plug on Saturn and Sega of America, or at least why he helped pull the plug. Um, this document shows it was doing very poorly. <laughs> and if that's all he saw, if all he saw was this data, like he, you'd, you'd, have to, yeah. you'd have to agree with him. So his his whole like quality title thing that he was like, we're only going to allow quality titles that that comes from like reading this document and realizing that there's so much poor quality software. Right. right? So it's right. like it's kind of like if this document had read different, if this document had told a different story, you know, he might have been in a different position. But, you know, I'm not trying to defend the man uh, again. Like no one, was, is. <laughs> uh, no one is. I, I feel like he made some good decisions. He made some poor decisions. But again this is what he had to go off of coming into the job, you know? And this is not like, this is scary. Like I would just be like, Oh, you're asking me to do an impossible task. <laughs> you know, like, exactly. We're, yeah. we're bleeding money as a company, you know, it's just crazy. 
And then, you know, they come out with the Dreamcast and they have a very successful launch. The console is doing well. It has great 3D graphical capabilities. The development environment for it's great. Everybody, mm-hmm. All the third parties who are working with it love it. It's, it's competitive. It does well. But it, it would seem that it didn't do well enough to pull Sega out of this extremely deep financial pit that they were in in the mid-90s. I mean, this was a ghost yeah. that would haunt Sega through to 2001. Such a deep financial pit that the owner himself would put his own money up to save or at least keep the company going for a while. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's no wonder they left the hardware business. Sega of America lost the entire company so much money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On on a, you know, playing like a long game that they hoped would pay off, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, just they weren't able to execute on several fronts you know and it you just gotta think about how much of a perfect storm it was for sony oh yeah to take oh. advantage of because all this financial stuff aside this giant money pit sega dug themselves into aside mm-hmm. the development environment that was made for playstation which was kind of revolutionary at the time ish mm-hmm. new uncharted 3d graphics and we have a development kit that doesn't suck we have a development kit that Third parties can very easily learn and get used to. You can get into this newfangled 3D thing right away and very easily make games for it. Mm-hmm. That was They were striking that iron right when Sega had like broken both of its legs yep. with um, the financial problems they were going through. And keep in mind, Saturn's development kits, while they were not as good as Sony's right away, their development kits for Saturn were, were the norm. Mm-hmm. release the hardware without any manuals without any engines that's what everybody did for 16-bit for 8-bit at least that's what the people i've interviewed have, have been telling me i'm sure there's more nuance to it than that but what sony did with their dev kits was so smart and so um so good timing wise and it really let them do so well while sega was doing so poorly and mm-hmm. really just furthered the gap between sony and sega from the very beginning um with their relationship to third parties. They were they were a disruptor. Yeah, I would I would say Sega or Sony was a market disruptor in the in the, in the truest yeah. form of the word. And I mean, they literally changed how games are made, the scale on which games are made, and how mm-hmm. the barrier to entry for game development became much lower. You know, it was like you could get monkeys in to do work on certain aspects of a game, and they were able to like use the tools. You know, um, right. versus somebody right. who had to be a seasoned programmer in assembly you know to be able to and read in a thick document on the chip just to know what the memory addresses were and stuff like that. it's just a new ball game and and again sega it was really a story of them not really being able to change with the times quick enough yeah and as like a sega fan looking at this this dynamic of sony striking really really well while sega was so so down mm-hmm. the saturn itself as a machine is highly capable of being competitive with the playstation right. even in terms of 3d graphics we mm-hmm. look at stuff like virtua fighter 2 we look at digital dance mix which i hate to bring that up as an example no, it's a wonderful example it's yeah bit. yeah it's really good um you look at Burning Rangers, the late end 3D games. Mm-hmm. You look at that Unreal port that XL2 did. Mm-hmm. There's very tangible evidence that the Saturn was capable of doing 3D on parity with with Sony's great 3D games on PlayStation. Agreed. Yeah. It's just that they couldn't get game designers to do them as early as PlayStation because of the mm-hmm. development environment. And they were also in such a financial pit that they they couldn't spend the capital needed to get those games out and get them visible and market them early market them well yeah um it was really kind of a we need to make money we need to have a successful business we have the console it was clear they had the console you, you, mm-hmm. it's hard to dispute that nowadays but they did not have the the money <laughs> well yeah i mean that's you said it right there like even in japan where the saturn did incredibly well and the playstation yeah. arguably didn't have a very great start like you look at games like kingsfield um, they're very mm. primitive. You, they, like oh, jumping, yeah, like jumping. I love jumping flash, but I mean, you look at the graphics; they're they're every bit as primitive as some of the early Saturn games. Not that impressive, and and you think, okay, so like both consoles went through growing pains to get to they where, did. like to get to Gran Turismo. You know, it only took a while before so, they had Spyro the Dragon in 1999. Before they had Crash Bandicoot three, the stuff that looked really good. Gran Turismo two, right? It took them time. Tekken three took them time. But they had time because Ken Kutaragi told Hideki Sato, he's like, dude. 
I'm going to win because I'm going to spend you into the ground. We have money for days and we can mm-hmm. leverage our, we can leverage all of our other corporate arms, you know, like all of the, the Walkmans. I mean, the Walkman. Tony's coming in from having made money in other mediums. Sega's I mean, just yeah. video games. Like the Walkman brand alone, they, they made more than probably Nintendo and, <laughs> you know, Sega combined <laughs> exactly. with their Walkman brand because everybody bought a Walkman. Not, you know, your grandma mm-hmm. bought a Walkman. It was just crazy. Oh, yeah. you know? So, so yeah, they were able to leverage that and they were really able to leverage that pressure that they could put on retailers. Well, we, you know, we have this much other retail space in your store, right? That where we're, you know, you're selling our products and they're, and they're making you a ton of money, like b- probably bigger margins than video games. What was the margin again for, for Saturn games? It was like 6% or something? Yeah, I think it was 6%. And what was funny, and this is not necessarily a bad thing, um, as some have pointed out to me, but the Pico had a better margin than the Saturn. If, 13, if the store yeah. sold a Pico, they would literally make more money more than money. they would if they sold a Saturn, which that's just kind of funny. More than anything, it's not a bad thing. It just meant Sega had a good product that made stores money. Did we know um, what Sony's, did we know what PlayStation's margin was? Uh, they had they had a few samples of Sony's margins, and uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were higher than Saturn's by by a, by a small amount. So I mean, um, as a so, store clerk, yeah. there would be an incentive to sell more Playstations and more Playstation software. Like exactly, yeah, no, that's totally correct. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> it was it was dark. <laughs> I mean, you're right. It was a perfect storm. Everything. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't just one thing. It was a million things. You know, uh, we got we 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 heard about the warp uh development you know warp is not satisfied with uh sony computer entertainment's distribution policy and they're only going to be making games for sega saturn and m2 that was like a bit of a positive note but uh, right you also had uh an email where tom talks about the game industry as a whole that if the video game industry does not find a way of increasing retailer margins we will soon be left with only specialty store distribution Mm -hmm. in the past year we've seen many retailers exit the business Macy's, Shopco, Hills, Kohl's, etc. He he didn't put this in there, but at that time, Babbage's was closing a bunch of stores. They were yeah. they were restructuring and turning into GameStop all the way back then. Um, yeah. And uh, the dude who I told you about, who who like uh, worked during the those three console launches, his store closed up like at the end of '96. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's crazy. Uh, more this year, if the margin is not increased, the toy industry went through this several years ago and had to make changes to address this. So all the way back then, the market started changing to what we know now is you you walk into Target and you buy, buy a plastic credit card that redeems a, a license to play a game, right? Exactly. So the margins on that are ridiculous. <laughs> you know, the mom mar- kind of predicted the future, so he, to speak. And he did. this was a problem. The profit margins of the video game industry for retailers is a problem that Sega contributed to, but that seemed to be industry wide, mm-hmm. even in the 90s. And yeah, and specialty stores, you know, that like you had mentioned in a post last week, Limited Run is kind of one of those specialty stores that does this now. Like we're, we're seeing that email from Tom become reality now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's kind of scary. We hear about, you know, Sony selling their newer PlayStations, like three, four, et cetera, at a loss. Yeah. Right. Because they want to be able to stay in stores. Yeah. This is why. Yeah, you know, I worked at Circuit City during the Dreamcast launch, and I mm-hmm. we, we sold a lot of Dreamcasts. It was actually really popular until the PlayStation Two came, of course. Um, That's right. You worked at Circuit City. I did. Yeah. I did. I was Let's like se- seven. Boys. I was like seventeen. Um, yeah. What I remember is that we really didn't push the N64 that much. Like, the, and it's funny. Like, I know tons of articles talk about how great the N64 was, or how you know it held on for a while, but. Really, the thing is, we, we didn't make a lot of money selling Nintendo 64 games because they were cartridges mm-hmm. and they were incredibly expensive. So there yeah. was a paper thin margin, you know, whereas like we'd make a good chunk of change on selling Dreamcast games, you know. So it was like there was more incentive to sell Dreamcast games. And then, of course, Sony PlayStation and PlayStation 2 made a lot of money on those. So it was like we really didn't push the N64 games. And as a result, you know, Sony held on with the with the original PlayStation 1 well into the 2000s you know they were still yeah. releasing stuff and then yeah it's just but yeah those margin publishing games is not cheap you know no, the paper no. and now and then of course as a result we get into the mid 2000s and then into the um 2010s you see manuals go away and now it's just an insert you know they, right they, yeah you get like a piece of paper in there now they it's were dumb. systematically <laughs> lowering consumers expectations and trying to raise the amount of profit margin that they could make on these things by by cheaping out on on the production yep 
I want to talk a bit about the canceled games before we we uh, close this off. Yeah, please do. You um, wrote an amazing article too. Thank you. There's, I, I I did a bit of a recount. And I'm gonna have to add to that article because there are for sure at least 80 canceled games listed in this document. That's not including code names that became games. Like we think it mentions Daytona Remix a lot. And we think that's just Daytona Championship Circuit Edition. Mm. Uh, Virtua Fighter 2 Remix, they mentioned that a few times. That's probably Fighters Megamix or maybe Virtua Fighter Kids. Mm -hmm. Or Or, it could just be an assumption on their part, which they did a lot in this document. Oh, It's just a foregone conclusion. We're going to remix it, right? We're remixing everything else. (laughs) It's the 90s. We remix everything. Yeah, yeah. So they mentioned a bunch of other games in here that they want released throughout 96 and uh, in 97. They even have some calendars that go all the way into early 1998. And uh, two of the games that get mentioned are Virtua Fighter 3 and uh, uh, a a game that they're referring to as VFRPG, Mm -hmm. Virtua Fighter RPG, which we know now as a code name for Shenmue. Mm -hmm. So Sega of America was privy to Shenmue as far back as April of 1996. That's important to note. Yep. And both of those are being developed alongside the Saturn 2, which basically was a planned device kind of like the 32X that would enhance Saturn's 3D capabilities. That was mainly developed in Japan. They did not release it. Um, They talk a lot about uh, Syndicate Wars. That never came out for the Saturn at all. Elder Scrolls Arena is mentioned a few times, Mm -hmm. which that would have been a crazy good port if they were able to pull it off and do it well. That would have been great, Um, but obviously that never happened. Uh, They talk about Heart of Darkness, which there's a leaked build of it online. You can go play it. And they talk about that being a key third-party title to like help save the Saturn. They wanted to make two point five million dollars off of it in 1996. You can play it on an emulator, right? Like, because it because can. you can't do it on a real Saturn though, right? Because of the memory. I think so. The yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. issues with it, but yeah, you have to. But you can download and play it. Right. Um, they talk about Ray Earth coming out, Magic Knight Ray Earth coming out in 1996, which of course that would just become the last <laughs> game ever released for it. Right. Crazy yeah. Ivan. Got canceled, right? They talk about Toonstruck, Unnecessary Roughness, Wing Commander 4, uh, Wizardry 6 and 7, Fade to Black, some game called Squid, uh, Mist 2, um, Criticom 2, Alien vs. Predator, mm-hmm. all games that got canceled, mm-hmm. all games that did not come out. Uh, and they also talk about Star Wars, a Star Wars Saturn game that they're referring to as Alien Hive. They refer to that a few times in this document. And, of course, there's no Star Wars game on Saturn at all. There's a prototype of a game called Rebel Strike that we now know of where uh, it's some prototype of a speeder bike on Endor where you're blowing up right. you know, Empire guys. Mm-hmm. Um, we think that that might be what they're talking about, but it's tough to say because the code name's different. Riglord Saga 2 never came out. Uh, Roach Racing. <laughs> Still don't know what the fuck yeah. that is. <laughs> Whatever it is, we, we didn't get it. <laughs> well, no one got it. Uh, and many of these games did come out for Saturn, but made, but only in Europe or only in Japan. Right. And and a whole big chunk of them, at least 30 of them, are games that just never came out at all. Mm. Um, so they're banking on a whole bunch of games to help save the Saturn, but none of them are happening. And another thing that's funny is they don't even bring up Castlevania, which was a game that they had advertised in E3 1995. So by this point in time, they had already found out that they're not getting Castlevania. They would have advertised it. They would have talked about it. So we know for sure that by this point in April 1996, Sega of America is like, we're not getting it. Don't know why, but they knew at that point that it, it ain't happening, Captain. Mm-hmm. And um, two other weird things to mention about the canceled games. They talk about Virtua Cop 3 for the Saturn. They talk about Virtual On 2 for the Saturn. Mm-hmm. These two seem to be Sega of America hedging a bet that these games will get created and will come out for Saturn. Virtua Cop 3 did not come out into the arcades until 2003. Right. And when I interviewed the devs, like, yeah, there were no Virtua Cop 3 plans at this time. That's not something that they're doing Mm -hmm. in the mid-90s. So this is just Sega of America saying, oh, they're going to make it. Right. Right. A part of their communication problem, for sure. Virtual on 2 is in the same boat to a lesser extent. They had projected a Saturn port of Virtual on 2 um to come out about a month or so before it actually wound up coming out in the arcades right we of course didn't see that come out until the dreamcast for a home console port that is you so, can't just bank on these kind of assumptions right know? right exactly exactly so they're thinking oh sega of japan will definitely make virtual cop 3 but they didn't for until the turn of the millennium right oh the dreamcast had died like <laughs> it was yeah stuff like that popped up here which is interesting 
uh, there's at least, you know, 80 canceled games and I and mm. will continue to update the article on the Shiro website about it. But but yeah. So for Panda, for your docuseries, what does this document mean? Like, how does this uh, what kind of insight is this going to provide, do you think? And, and what will be your ultimate takeaway from all of this? Tremendous insight into their financial state. So much about games that I haven't covered yet mm-hmm. that th- th- this definitely adds to, like knowing about what's going on with NBA action with at, with the NFL games. I don't think I'm going to re-edit any episode. Right. I think I am going to be making a 20 or 30 minute video just about the document. Nice. Um, I might be writing a script for it already. <laughs> um, it helped confirm your research on the on the launch dates, right? It you, did. That's yeah. great. For me and Pimpo's release date research, the two of us, um, you nailed didn't it. Didn't seem to get anything wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, yeah. Props on to both of you for that. This this document. Thank you. This this document has a release calendar for these 1995 games came out in these months, mm-hmm. and it does not conflict at all with what me and Pimpo found out. So That's we're awesome. very very happy about that. That was very vindicating. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um. I think that this document's going to get referenced in just about every video that I make about any game that came out in 95 or 1996. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, 80 years from now when I start making games about 1990 that came out in 1997, right? <laughs> Maybe mm-hmm. then I'll stop talking about it. Maybe I don't know, but I feel like this is going to be a gift that keeps on giving. Mm-hmm. Here's another thing I want to bring up. We need more of these. Yes. I think this answers a lot of questions. I think this brings up a lot of unanswered questions. Mm-hmm. I think that we we need to talk to people who are name dropped in this document. I right. think that more fiscal year confidential document type things like this need to come out. I think if anyone has them, they need to scan them and they need to release them right away. Mm-hmm. I hope that more of these pop up on the internet. I hope that we get more insight into the life of Sega in the mid nineties. Um, this already gives us so much but it tells us that there's so much more to be talked about and to be discovered. Right. Um, it's just great that it came out and I can only hope that more things like this do. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just sitting on a hard drive somewhere, you know, there's a yeah, outlook know, personal right? makes folder you think file. People <laughs> are just sitting on stuff like this, like this guy, golden dreamcast. He sat on it for a couple of years. He was working to release it. Right. I'm not saying that he's wrong. For exactly. That. He was definitely making an effort to get it out there. He, he just wanted to do it yeah. right. Yeah. He didn't it just want took to... him some time for of illusion crapped out on him. And then he just said, fuck it. I'm doing it myself. I'm doing it myself. So, yeah, exactly. Props, props to him yet again for doing that. Thank exactly. you so much. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, and I think this is, you're right. We need to, these stories are going to die with these people and with these yeah. machines that are going to get scrapped or whatever. It's like, this is game history. We we Absolutely. are, as an industry, they're much better about this nowadays, uh, documenting stuff. And even then they, they have work to do, but I mean, they've gotten better about saving and archiving certain things and they're able to do these like HD remakes with all this extra Mm -hmm. collateral and ephemera Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But it's like back then, a lot of things were just thrown away, you know? And so with it, they threw away like stories and and histories of how these games were made and what the situation was. So it's like when we get something like this, it really helps paint a broader picture. Unfortunately, in this case, it was a really grim one that told us that Sega was in a much worse position than we thought. Like we always knew Sega was in a bad position, but we just Mm -hmm. didn't know how bad because they were their outward face was very positive. They were like, Oh, we sold over a hundred thousand Saturns, you know, <laughs> and it was like in our first one, no, <laughs> that maybe sell in, but not sell through. You maybe know? Yeah. that's a fat ass. That's, maybe yeah, too. that is too. Yeah. <laughs> but according to this document, that's not the case. <laughs> no, they, they lied about some of their sales numbers. We've confirmed that now we knew it was like, we knew it was bad. We had no idea that it was this bad. Now you can lie to the press, but I don't know if you think you can lie to your shareholders. So no, you yeah. can't. <laughs> Unless it's about Mysteria not selling. Oh right, you yeah, lie then, to your shareholders. Yeah, yeah, just just put a zero there. <laughs> right, yeah, just just forget about that. Legal comes up if this gets you know uh, brought in a court case about it. Let's let's just put a zero on it, just mm-hmm. in case it gets subpoenaed. <laughs> Well, it was great having you on, Nick. Um, always wonderful to talk to you and great having you on uh, as a member of the Shiro podcast. And I love your video. I love your Panda videos when they do come. I know they're they're a huge uh, works in progress and a passion project that you do when you have time 
because you have a, a job and a, a, oh, a time life is the enemy, you know? time is the enemy. <laughs> if only you could just clone yep. yourself, right? You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, you got to get on that. You had uh, like an, uh, some or bots. You could just <laughs> tell them to do your editing. <laughs> tell for them you. to do the news now, right? Uh, maybe Chat thing. GPT will start uh, editing your videos for you. Uh, who knows? But oh no, no, <laughs> no. I uh, no. Hopefully not. <laughs> Just only joking. Anyway, but right. uh, but yeah, so folks definitely need to go check out Nick's uh, uh, documentaries. Where can they find you? Uh, yeah, go to YouTube, type in Pandemonium Reviews Every U.S. Sega Saturn Game, um, and that, I should come up right away. Um, I'm also on uh, various social sites. So Awesome. And then you guys can catch us at SegaSaturnShiro.com. You can also find Nick through our website because he's on the main menu. And then uh, also play Sega Saturn on social platforms. Just uh, type in play Sega Saturn. Um, we'll have an editor's corner coming out uh, probably like half a month to a month from now. I'm doing some, have something lined up with Pat and then another thing lined up with Peter. So yeah, we'll keep the content coming. And uh, until next time, it's been Saturn Dave and Pandemonium reminding you that you must play your Sega Saturn. We hope you guys have a, a great uh, rest of your month. Take care. Play your Saturn. Or else you're going to get a beating from Sega. To, he'll jump out of your closet. Judo flip you out the window. <laughs>